there to page 384 right just one page inside the back cover and we'll sing because he lives page 384 
were singing that second verse about how sweet to hold our newborn baby, Daniel popped out in the aisle and Anyway, he was enjoying the song. We were too. <laughs> Page three, 312, he lives. Good to see you here. Glad for everyone that came out this morning on this Easter Sunday morning. Remember our service at 6 o'clock tonight. Brother Scott will be preaching for us. Uh, come back at 6 o'clock for that. I haven't had a chance to talk to our clerk yet, but if it will work, we're going to have our business meeting the 18th. The 18th. Okay. Other announcements need to be made? How many are glad to be here on Easter Sunday morning? Say amen. All right, I am too. This is, a, this is one of our country's, the world's holidays, but it's not just a holiday. It is a special holy day, which is where holiday comes from. Uh, let, let, me, let me tell you what the world thinks is important. They, they put together figures, and, and I read some of them, and it said that uh, Easter is the second top selling candy holiday that we have. Isn't that important, Brother Ron? <laughs> Follows Halloween. But I found it interesting, more than 90 million chocolate Easter bunnies are made every year. I didn't get one. <laughs> not, not one. And the largest Easter egg ever made weighed almost eight tons over 15,000 pounds, and I didn't get a bite. <laughs> and we eat 16 million jelly beans today in America. 
But I got better news than that. Christ arose. Christ arose. Brother Ronnie Strothers, would you lead us in prayer, please? We're thankful again for the privilege we have to come out to our house to worship the in spirit and truth, especially on this special day to the Lord. And we just praise everyone that's came out this morning to the Lord. And we ask the Lord that just guide and direct us and help us to do your will to the Lord each day we live to the Lord. And we give you the praise for what you do for us. And we're thankful for the privilege we have of coming out to this little country church and worship the in spirit and truth. And just <coughs> Got so many things to be thankful for this year. Lord, we'll just give you the praise for what you do for us, and what, how you guide us and direct us. And forgive us, Lord, when we make our mistakes. We're not perfect yet, Lord. We're looking forward to that perfect day, Lord. And we just give you the praise. Now, be in the service of the Lord. And give lay the message to the Lord that we all stand in need of, the <coughs> Lord, that we can apply to our hearts to be a better Christian this coming week than we have been in the past. Now forgive us and guide us and we give these praise for the thing in thy name. Amen. 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 Page 365. 365. Just as a reminder, a year ago Easter Sunday we had our first drive-in service here at church and I want to say thanks to everyone who jumped in to help make that a possibility so we could worship last year at this time even under uh, different circumstances. Do be with us tonight. Brother Scott will be preaching. Let me make an announcement about next Sunday night. It's going to be a very special service. I've invited uh, a dear a friend couple uh, that we know over from Southwest City, Missouri, to be here. And I don't want to take away from the story they're going to share. I'm just telling you, you need to be here next Sunday night. Their name is Jerry and Linda Abercrombie, a wonderful, wonderful couple. And you will want to be here next Sunday night. Let's sing page 365, page 365, Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It, 365. We'll sing one more song just before Brother Lee comes. And I want to publicly say thanks to our Sunday school teacher, Brother Ken Kenneth Dotson, and his tender heart and the wonderful lesson this morning. Thank you, Kenneth. God bless you. Page 386.
Let's bow together and look to the Lord in prayer again. Brother Lauren, you're handy here. Would you lead us in prayer, please? Precious Heavenly Father, as we come before thee this morning, thank you, Lord, for all your goodness and mercy to us. Thank you for our church, Lord, and thank you for this good singing. I pray that you bless Brother Lee as he brings some message, Lord. Bless our hearts with it, Lord. Thank you for everything you do for us. These things you ask in my name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. Glad to have this good number here this morning. Glad to have some visitors with us who are not usually here. I'm not going to call you out. But I, I'd uh, like for you, if you'd like to uh, say, I'm here, and stand and tell us who you are. Anybody want to do that? Any, any visitors? We, we've got visitors who are home folks, you know, and, and have come back. And, and I was told, just wanted to be at Massey for, for uh, Easter Sunday service. Hey, that's, that's good. I wanted to be at Massey, too, this morning. And glad we're here. Well, we, we have some home folks back, and, and uh, there's uh, three young men I would like to introduce. You'll forgive me, I think. Ethan and Betsy are here with, uh, with uh, three little guys that I'd call them up and have, have you see them from up here, but they might take over. I'm not sure whether <laughs> they take over the, the service or not. Hoyt and Gatlin and new baby, Fletcher. Fletcher Bill, was that it, Ethan? What? <laughs> now, 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 what's his name? Did, did you hear that again? <laughs> <laughs> Little Fletch, Fletcher Lee. And I, I hadn't seen him until this morning. First time I'd got to see Fletcher Lee, and he looks pretty good, really. <laughs> he looks pretty good. How many are glad that Christ arose? Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 1. We're trying to get through that. We're going to have communion in a minute, or in a little while. And uh, uh, Dwayne cut back the music, and I was to cut back my sermon. And Darlene said this morning, have you got that much? I've got seven pages of notes. <laughs> but evening service doesn't start till 6. I, I shall try. Acts 1, verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through, through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he'd chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. Underline that, would you? By many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. I want to talk this morning a little while about the infallible proofs that Jesus died and lives and that we can too. Somebody said without the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Christian faith would have been stillborn for a living faith cannot survive a dead Savior. Did you get that? A living faith can't survive a dead Savior. Let's go back to Jerusalem. Something like, uh, I can't pinpoint time back then. Nobody can, but somebody tried and said it would be 1,988 years ago now. About this time, early April uh, of uh, 33 A.D., 6 o'clock in the morning, Sunday morning, garden with a tomb in it, and there's a group of women walking quietly, slowly, cautiously through the olive trees toward that tomb bearing spices and ointment to anoint the body of their dead leader, Jesus Christ. He'd been executed. He'd been crucified the week before. And now Sunday morning as they approach his tomb, they find out that he is no longer dead. 
They're concerned because the tomb has been sealed with a big stone that they say probably weighed at least two tons. And then the, the, the Roman government's seal had been placed across it, a rope or a tape or a, 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 some kind of a, a, a string and sealed at both ends. Not that it would keep people out, but it bore the authority of the Roman government and anybody that broke that seal would be put to death. And as they approach, they wonder, how can we convince the Roman soldiers to move the stone out of our way so that we can properly anoint the body of our Savior? They weren't going to embalm him. They just anointed the bodies of the dead. And they got a little closer, and they saw that the Roman guard of 16 crack soldiers the best trained in the Roman legions were on guard. But they were lying on the ground asleep. And the stone that would have taken four men to move was moved. And the grave was open. And as they got closer, they saw that the tomb was empty. Nobody was there. That wasn't his home anymore. He had come forth. What happened? Where's his body? Why is the tomb empty? What does that mean? What did it mean for them and what does it mean for us? The question is this. Did Jesus really, really rise from the dead? You see, they and we see death as the absolute end of this life. So did Jesus somehow overcome that and rise again? Well, the scripture Luke says in our scripture that there were many infallible proofs. And I want to just look at that this morning for a little bit. That, that's, that's such an important question. Did he rise again? Is it just something that we hope? What about it? Well, let's look at the evidence. I'm not an investigator, but... We can read the Bible, and let's see what the Bible has to say about that. First of all, the Roman guard. Pilate ordered the guard, and I said there were 16 soldiers. If it was a Roman guard, it was 16. If it was a temple guard, it was more than that. Probably it was a Roman guard. And Four soldiers would stand watch at a time, and the other 12 could rest. And they would lie down on the grass and rest probably, but the four were awake. And then in four hours they changed and four others took the, the position of guarding the tomb. They were highly trained. They knew what they were doing. And they knew, these soldiers knew, that if they went to sleep on their duty time, they paid with their lives. I read somewhere that sometimes they were burned to death with their own clothing. Rome was strict. Rome ruled with an iron heel. And the soldiers knew they had to do what they were supposed to do. So they had every reason to stay awake and would not have gone to sleep under any circumstances except they were touched, I believe, by the hand of God and put to sleep. And there they lay when the ladies got there. And then the stone, the stone that was rolled over the door of the tomb. I've been to the tomb, didn't see the stone. It's not there anymore. Don't know what happened to it. But the opening would admit a large heavy stone and that's probably what they had there and the ladies coming to the tomb knew they couldn't move it but it was gone it was gone and it had to be had to have been rolled back by some supernatural force 
So there was the Roman guard and there was the stone and then there were the grave clothes. When they looked in, they saw that Jesus was not, was not there, but his grave clothes were there. They wrapped the, the dead in long, long, long pieces of cloth for burial. And, and that had been done, but the wrapping sheets were still there and the napkin that had covered his face was folded and still uh, was still there. Uh, grave robbers wouldn't have bothered to take that off of him. They'd have just taken it, him away. And so when he rose from the death, he... The dead, he must have just passed right through those grave clothes because he didn't need grave clothes anymore and never would wear them again. And then there's the empty tomb itself. Let's think about that. The, the skeptics have never been able to explain what happened to the body of Jesus. When Mary arrived, the tomb was empty. Later, Peter and John came to the tomb. You know what? It was empty. When the other disciples finally got to the tomb, it was empty. When, when the Jews came to inspect the tomb, it was empty. And when the Roman soldiers woke up from their sleep, it was empty. Nobody disputes that particular fact. But a few weeks later, after the crucifixion, the disciples were publicly preaching that Jesus had risen from the dead. <laughs> if they had been lying about that, all the authorities would have had to do would be to simply go to the tomb and pull out the dead body of Jesus. But they didn't do that because they couldn't do that. The tomb was empty. <laughs> and then there were resurrection appearances. The so-called dead Jesus showed himself many times over the next 40 days. At least 12 separate times we read about in the scriptures. He appeared sometimes to individuals. He appeared sometimes to small groups. He appeared once to two people on the road to Emmaus. You'll remember that. He appeared to a group of 500 people. Uh, and, and, and then after this all happened, he appeared to Stephen at his death and to Saul, who became Paul on the road to Damascus, he appeared to all these people as a well alive Savior. And you might dismiss one or two of those accounts, but 12? He appeared. He appeared. And then, let me say that I believe that there was unbelief that proved the belief is correct. Because the disciples themselves did not, after the crucifixion, expect to see Jesus alive. Do you remember that? They were doubting, not just Thomas. We talk about Thomas uh, doubting Thomas, but the others didn't expect to see him alive. And so all this points to one thing, that Jesus did come forth out of the tomb. And then notice how the disciples were changed. At the crucifixion, they were scared. They were scared to death. They were confused. They were dazed. They were disappointed. They were sad. They were disheartened. Every one of them was running for cover. Peter had even denied him. And he wept bitterly because of it. But they were... They were trying to escape with their own lives because their master was, they thought, dead. But then, later, they became flaming evangels who preached the message to anybody that would sit still that Jesus is alive again. <laughs> you know what? For 2,000 years now, nobody's come up with a satisfactory answer to the question, if he didn't come forth and alive, what happened to his body? Nobody had it. Nobody had it. Nobody ever will have it. Because he is alive. He is alive. You can travel the Holy Land from the north to the south and from the east to the west, and you can find archaeologists about everywhere. They're digging in the Holy Land, and they find bones everywhere but they don't find the bones of Jesus. 
because they're not there. They are not there. He is risen, as he said. But now, let's, let's be fair for just a little <laughs> while to those who don't believe in the resurrection and see what they say about it. Well, the earliest answer they had for the resurrection was what's called the swoon theory. Have you heard of that? The swoon theory. They contended that Jesus didn't really die. He just swooned, or in other words, he fainted. He was injured. He was crucified. But they say he just passed out, and so they took him down and <clears throat> carried his body or dragged it or however they did it, along with 25 pounds of embalming spices uh, through the darkening day to the tomb and laid him there and le left him for <coughs> dead, rolled a stone in place, sealed the tomb, and that was the end of it. And sometime during that night in the coolness of the tomb, Jesus woke up, they say, and he rolled the stone away from the inside where you couldn't get a hold of it. He rolled the stone away and unwrapped his shroud and left it there and walked out and overcame the squad of 16 Roman soldiers and put them all to sleep and appeared in perfect health to Mary and the ones that he saw. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, think about it. He had been beaten within an inch of his life. He had been kicked. He hadn't worn a, a crown of thorns, and he carried a heavy cross until he collapsed. Hung on the cross six hours in complete and utter agony. Had his joints dislocated from the crucifixion. Finally had his spear thrust through his side and punctured his lungs and his heart evidently, and the Roman soldiers didn't even break his legs because they, the expert executioner said he's already dead. No need to fool with that. Everybody that saw him thought he was dead. The Romans, the Jews, the disciples, they all thought he was dead. And you know what? They were right. I believe he died completely and totally for me and for you. And how those who hold on to the swoon theory do is beyond me. Actually, very few people anymore say that. But they do say sometimes that the, that the tomb was mistaken, that they went to the wrong place. And they went to the wrong tomb, and nobody was buried in that tomb, and so they assumed that he had been taken away. As a matter of fact, the gardener said he's not here. He, he, was, he was saying... The one you're looking for was, was not, not buried here, they say. But do you know if they went to the wrong tomb when the sun came up and it got daylight, they could see that? Don't you think? They could see that, and they could go to the other one. And so, so others say, well, they stole his body away. They started saying that in Matthew early. They started saying that way back then. But who'd steal the body? Why would they steal the body? The Romans wouldn't steal it. They didn't care about it one way or the other. It was the Jews who were opposed to him. Why would they steal it? They wanted him to stay dead forever. They wanted him to stay in that tomb forever. <laughs> and why would the disciples steal it? They weren't looking for a resurrection. They didn't fully understand yet. Remember, the women were coming to anoint the dead body of our Lord not the living Jesus. <laughs> and then there's the hallucinations theory, and I'm about to get tired of talking about these, but let me mention this. And this is the one that's often put forth today, that, that the disciples were so hopeful that Jesus would come forth that they began to believe that he did. They, they imagined it. They had hallucinations Believe, uh, making them to believe that he had come forth from 
the dead. But the disciples, when they heard, didn't believe it. They didn't hallucinate and think it happened. When they got the news that it had happened, they had a hard time believing it. And, and so we just need to face the facts. And I believe the facts are on our side. The resurrection of Jesus is one of the best evidenced events of ancient history. There's a lot more than I've talked about and I have time to talk about and than I know about. And, and, and let's get to this. The resurrection is one of the non-negotiable facts about Christianity. Either Jesus came forth out of the tomb, brethren, or we're in a world of hurt. Either he came forth out of the tomb or we're lost. There's no other way. No other way. It's not something that we're free to negotiate about. It's, it's not something that we're, we're free to disagree on a little bit and, and still get to heaven like, like when's the rapture going to happen? You know, we may have different ideas about that and still go to heaven. Or are we supposed to talk in tongues all the time or occasionally or never? I, I believe people can be saved and go to heaven and, and, and disagree a little bit on some things, but not about whether or not Jesus is a living Savior. We've got to believe that. Christians believe that. We may call ourselves a Christian and not believe that, but I could call myself a Chevy and not be an automobile. It's not what I say, necessarily. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he's a false prophet and we're lost. I believe that. I believe that. He cannot be our Savior if he is still dead in the tomb. We can't trust what he said if he's still dead. Heard of a missionary one time who was working in one of the more advanced countries, not darkest Africa or somewhere like that, and, and a man told him, your Christian religion is a religion of poverty because you don't have the body or the burial place of your leader to go to. And the Christian missionary said, that's just the purpose of our religion. That's just the basis of it because he is not buried anywhere. He is not buried. Oh, he was only for three days and three nights in a borrowed tomb. He didn't need one to keep. He just needed to borrow it for a little while, and then he came forth. And that's what the world needs to hear. That's what the world has to hear, brethren, that he is a living Savior. A dead Savior helps nobody, that he is a living Savior, and that he came forth. That he died, but that he came forth. And the fact that that happened, the fact that he did come forth, gives hope to everybody because he invites everybody to come to him. Now, I got to say this. I can't force you to believe it. I, I, I know you do. But there are those who don't, and I can't force anybody to believe it, and neither can you. We have to make that decision for ourselves. But the issue is kind of simple this morning. Where do you stand in relation to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? There is more than enough evidence for those of us who believe to believe, but I guess there's room also for those who reject it to reject it. But let's remember what Jesus told Thomas. We call him Doubting Thomas. He said, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, 
Reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. So evidently we have to make up our mind one way or the other. And it doesn't do us a lot of good to think about it intellectually only. If we remain outside of Christ and he remains outside of us, all the rest of this is not going to do us any good. If you want to go to heaven, I believe this is the truth. If you want to go to heaven, you must be in Christ and he must be in you. And we can't stay neutral because there's not really any middle ground. Either he did or did not arise. Either he did or he did not arise. I'm convinced he did. I know, I know from all experience we've had that death is the end. But it is not. According to all that the Word teaches and the, the, that our Lord teaches, it is, it is not. And I believe He arose and I've trusted Him with my life and I can't decide for anybody else and neither can you, but we can believe that. And He invites all to come and believe it and when we do, we can live again like He does. On this happy morning, and this is Easter, and it is a happy morning, I want to declare to you that Jesus is alive, folks. <laughs> what do you say to that? What do you believe about that? How are you going to base your life on that? Can you say with me, He is risen? Amen. God bless you. Now, last week we talked about the communion. And we're going to have communion now. And we're doing it in a different way. And this may seem a little bit awkward to us, but you, you know how we did it last time, do you? Do you remember? I, frankly, I had to be reminded. I don't remember. I didn't. But you, you have the elements of communion, and there are two lids on this little vial. There's a very clear cellophane one that you can peel off and you get to the wafer and then the main one gets to the juice. And so I want to look into Matthew for a couple of verses of scripture talking about the communion. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body. And so as we prepare to do that, let's bow together, if you would please. And I'm going to ask uh, Brother Reuben, would you ask the blessing on the bread? Dearly Father, thank you for... Letting us have a wonderful day today in your house today, dear Lord. We thank you for the wonderful message that Lee just gave us, Lord. We, we do thank you for, for what you did on the cross for us, Lord, that, that, you, that you were beaten and bruised and, 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 and gave your life that we may, may spend eternity with you, Lord. I pray, Lord, if there's somebody here today that doesn't know you, that they come to do it before it's too late, Lord. But, Lord, we, we take this bread as a representation of your body that you, could, that you did give for us, that we could spend eternity with you. We just thank you for everything that you've done, and we thank you for the day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, let's peel the top layer off, and let's, let's all eat together. Then Jesus told those who were gathered around the Passover table with him, it tells us he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, would you mind taking the, the mic to Brother Ron? Brother Ron, would you ask a blessing on the cup? Heavenly Father, Lord, we again we thank you. We thank you that the death and the tomb cannot hold Jesus, Lord, and we take this this cup and this drink, symbolizing uh, 
our belief in that, Lord. Love you, Father, and uh, praise you, dear Lord. Thank you for the sermon. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, then, if you're more successful than I am, you can uncover the cup. Shall we all drink together? Amen. Amen. We'll ask the group who's going to close our service with the song to come now. Would you please? This will be our benediction. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.